Hey, good evening. So I have a stuffy nose. Please don't call the police. But that just means you have to sing louder. Uh, but honestly, I'm feeling uh, great. And I'm glad to be worshiping the Lord together with you. Um, you know, there's a lot of churches uh, of different denominational stripes that uh, start every service or at some point in the service, they recite a creed. Um, we don't typically do that as a church. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't or can't, but uh, it's nice to be able to remind ourselves, what are, the, what are the core things that we believe? What unites us? What makes us a family? What separates us uh, maybe from the rest of the world in terms of what we believe and why we believe it? And so as we, as we begin our time tonight, let's just take some time to reflect on uh, what it is that we um, call our common creed. What is it that we, when we look at scripture, we can say those are the things that we stand on. That's the firm ground uh, beneath our feet. Let's sing together. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness grows in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again.
take a minute now to just play the just the chorus through and just let you focus just for a moment and ask the Lord and maybe you have to ask and maybe you don't um, what's the storm right now what is it the storm that you need to declare that my God is bigger than you when you were a kid my dad could beat up your dad right well as Christians <laughs> what do we get to say my God is king of the universe so just think about the storm going on in your life right now. I will lift my eyes to 
the hills of their creator who made all heaven and earth. He watches me. For he watches me. He will not sleep, no, never slumber. He says, just thank you so much for this uh, family that you've brought together. I thank you for uh, the, the care and the concern that we have for one another. And I thank you that uh, we are able to come to you and we're able to know that we can lay these burdens down at your feet and that you are uh, you're sovereign and you are infinitely more powerful than we are. And that you continue to love us even when we our acts rebellious or selfish and do things that uh, goes against your will. You still love us and you still uh, are there uh, ready to accept us into your arms. And Lord, just bring these uh, prayer requests that, uh, that we've shared. Uh, we bring them to you and we just ask that you just be involved. Uh, let your presence be felt in each one of them. I pray that you just continue to be with uh, my father-in-law, Bob, as he is uh, recovering from a broken leg. And I just keep him safe as uh, COVID continues to be a problem in healthcare facilities. I pray that you'll be with Tiger as he's uh, suffering with a migraine. I pray you'll just give him uh, relief and uh, help him to, to get through this. I pray you'll just be with uh, Jay's mom. She's at the hospital. And uh, I just pray that you'll just be in that situation and you'll just bring uh, healing and comfort to her. I pray you continue to be with the search team as we uh, seek after your will and uh, pray that you will guide us and show us with confidence that the uh, individual that you want uh, to have come be part of our family. And I just pray for uh, Joyce and this illness that uh, has come for over a month now. Um, it's situations like this that we can't even begin to understand uh, what's happening or what's going on or why these things happen. Uh, and sometimes we just have to accept the fact that you know what's going on so much more than we do, and we just have to turn it over to you and just put our trust in you. And I pray that you'll just be with her 
that you'll give her uh, relief from this fever and that you will uh, just get her through this, this season and that you'll get her, uh, get her to healthy again and able to continue to do what you've called her to do. Pray just be with Bruce as he's not been feeling particularly well last week or so, that you'll just be with him, give him the uh, clarity of thought and the strength to uh, bring the message that he's prepared for us. Ask all these things in your name. Amen. So for about five years now, no, maybe about four years, I've been printing all my sermons out in 14-point font. And uh, I'm telling you that because about 10 minutes before the service started, I realized tonight's is in 12. So um, if the podium's a little higher, you'll know why. (laughs) And if it goes a little longer, because I have just about as many pages. Um, No, I'm just kidding. I want to talk to you uh, this week and for the next several weeks about um, God's mission. I'm thinking a lot about this uh, as we, uh, a couple months ago, spent a a good chunk of time, actually end of summer into the fall in John 15, talking about um, God the gardener, Jesus the, the vine, us the branches, and how many times in that passage of scripture, it's the love of God poured out in Jesus, that Jesus pours out into us, that we are called to pour out into one another. And it it blends into this idea of trying to understand and discern what is God's mission, because as we understand God's mission, we understand our mission. Of all of God's created beings, only mankind had those incredible words spoken over them at creation. Let us create mankind in our image. I would offer to you that that's a, little, that's a sentence that you could think about, like, forever. The implications of those simple words, let us make man in our image. First of all, to those of you that, uh, those in the world that claim that Christians are polytheistic because we worship more than one God. No, we worship one God in Father, Son, and Spirit, as we sang about as we opened our worship time. But it was this God who said, let us. Let us make man in our image. I think part of the unraveling of those words means coming to terms with just how we image God. If we have been made in his image, in the image of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, part of the unraveling of that is to try to discern how exactly we image God. The dolphins weren't told to do this. The trees weren't told to do this. The mountains weren't told to do this. Uh, The giraffes weren't told to do this. Just man created in God's image. Male and female, he created them to do this very thing, reflect the image of God. So starting this week and for the next several, I want us to think about this idea of mission. What is God's mission? And by extension, what is my mission? Those two things, they're, they're interrelated. And as we go through Scripture and as we look at Scripture and realize what God's mission is, we understand better what our mission is because they're one and the same. Again, back to John 15. uh, As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so have I loved you. And then what does he say? This is my command. Go and love. Father to Son, to us, to the world. As we understand and unpack God's mission, we understand our mission and our purpose all the more. You know, it's an awesome thing uh, to look at Scripture through the eyes of mission. And if you just think about it, who was God ever in relationship with that he left alone to stay the same? <laughs> Can you think of anybody in the Bible that, that God came to, for good or for bad, right? That God had an encounter with them and then walked away and they're like, okay, well, ho-hum, off they go. Who had encounters with God that didn't result in a shift of life direction. I'm going to do a real quick uh, sweep through scripture here. Uh, Noah called on mission to renew the world. Abraham called on mission out of his homeland to go to a land I will show you. What is that? What kind of direction is that? Joseph, Old Testament Joseph, on mission to Israel Uh, I'm sorry, from Israel into Egypt. Then you have Moses on mission from Egypt back to Israel 400 years later. 
God's got a mission for Joseph. That's to rescue the people of God out of Israel into Egypt. 400 years later, God raises up Moses to bring his people out of Egypt back into Israel. Joshua on mission to bring them from the threshold of the promised land into the promised land. Rahab, a mission out of Jericho into Israel and even into the bloodline of the Messiah himself. Gideon, a life mission from farmer to warrior. Ruth, on mission from Moab to Bethlehem. David, on mission from quiet pasture lands to the throne of Israel. Elijah, on mission to declare God's word to the powers of his day. Amos, from pruning trees <laughs> to a mission to speak God's judgment over Israel. Daniel on mission from Israel to captivity in Babylon. Nehemiah on mission from captivity back to Israel to rebuild the walls. Joseph, New Testament, on mission to serve his pregnant fiance based solely on a dream. John the Baptist on mission in the wilderness to make way, the, 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 the pathway, the highway for the coming king, Messiah. Titus sent on mission to Crete. Peter on a mission with the gospel to the Jews. Paul on mission with the gospel to the Gentiles. God never interacted with anybody in all of Scripture and left them the same. You can even take the opposite side and look at Pharaoh and look at King Ahab and look at a bunch of characters like that and say, wow, they didn't fare so well because they had an encounter with God. Would it be overstating it to say that a pretty major point of the Bible is to emphasize the idea that when human beings cross paths with their maker, the course of their life is forever changed? Because if it's not, I'm, I'm missing something. Whenever there's a genuine encounter between God and a person, we inevitably change, and that change has everything to do with finding and fulfilling God's unfolding mission or purpose for our lives. How many people understand themselves as Christians in the sense that they've been introduced to Jesus? They're familiar with the cross. They may be on speaking terms with the Father. But who remain either ignorant of or resistant to the idea that God's presence in their lives is for the very purpose of instilling within them a God sized mission. Maybe you were there in your own Christian journey for a number of months or years. You know what? I'm into the salvation thing. I like the not going to hell thing. I like the eternal rewards thing. But I'd like to just kind of live my life until I get there. How they're missing out. <laughs> How they're not understanding the, the, the full breadth of what God has desired to fill them and their lives with. And to miss this is to miss out on one of the main reasons behind God's mission. Consider one of the first, the very first mission assignments in the Bible given from God to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. This is God speaking says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, <coughs> and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is where we're going to unpack the first, I, the, the, the first aspect of the mission of God that is our mission as well. Five times in two verses, God uses the term blessing. And in three out of those five blessings pronounced by God, the blessing is God's to give. I will bless you, verse 2. You will be a blessing, and I will bless those who. So let's unpack this idea of blessing. One of the, the books that was very uh, beneficial to me uh, a number of years ago I'm not even sure when it was written, but uh, probably about at least 20 years ago, I would say, uh, 2004, close to it, is this book called The Blessing by John Trent and Gary Smalley. And it really, uh, the, the subtitle is Giving the Gift of Unconditional Love and Acceptance. One of the things that this book emphasizes is when, after it unpacks what the biblical idea of a blessing is, it talks about how do we go about doing that today? 
How do we bless our spouses? How do we bless our kids? How do we bless our neighbors? How are we a blessing to our coworkers and our relatives? How do we speak words of blessing? How do we do that and recapture that Old Testament idea today? It's called The Blessing by John Trent and Gary Smalley. Great, great book. What is a blessing? Well, the the dictionary definition of it uh, talks about invoking God's favor upon a person. That's pretty good, invoking God's favor on a person. Uh, How about this other definition, to bestow good of any kind upon? Wow, you really blessed me with that. Or to extol as holy. You know, I started reading through the Bible and the different examples of the way the word blessing is used. Let me give you some different examples of how Scripture itself uses the word blessing. The idea of what blessing is from a scriptural standpoint. Genesis 1, the first time the word appears, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. The first blessing in Scripture was speak, spoken over Adam and Eve because God had uniquely created them to procreate and fill the earth. And it says, God blessed them and said, now be fruitful and increase in number. Another take on this idea of blessing is Exodus 20, verse 11. Therefore, God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. <coughs> God took a day of the week and said, this day is set apart. So in these two instances, we can infer the idea of blessing is the establishing of something for a very specific God-exalting purpose blessed. Remember when the angel comes to Mary, blessed are you among women, set apart, unique. Well, let's look at another example of blessing in scripture. Numbers chapter 6, uh, 22 to 26. This is sometimes referred to as the Aaronic blessing, the blessing of Aaron. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, and maybe you've heard this in church services before, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Many times uh, pastors like to end services with the Aaronic blessing, the blessing of Aaron that God spoke uh, to Moses for Aaron and to share with the people. Here we see blessings as words that define a state of relationship between God and his people. The Lord bless you and keep you. And what does that blessing and keeping look like? It looks like God's face shining on you. Him being gracious to you. Turning his face toward you. Giving you peace. That's the experience of being in that place of blessing. Well, God, uh, Scripture uses another uh, way of, uh, has another way of referring to blessing. Uh, let me just give you a couple examples of this. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So similar to Psalm 112, blessed is the man or woman who fears the Lord. How about the opening of Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount message, Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Here we see blessing as a certain status or position that people can either be in or not. If you fear the Lord, there's a blessing for you. If your sins have been forgiven, well, you better believe there's a blessing been poured out over you. And it's capturing this idea of the state that we're actually in. Unfortunately, we don't actually live consciously aware of the blessed state we exist in. And I think Scripture is often extolling us to do that very thing. A blessing is like a small opening of the curtain between earth and heaven and actually experiencing a glimpse glimpse of the transcendent God in our very circumstances. You see the danger in overusing the term blessing? See how we need to kind of recapture this idea of what a blessing truly is all about? The times in your life when you've been truly blessed, those are intimate connections with spiritual things. When somebody uh, says to me, for just by way of example, and you, you, you may have your own examples of this too, but somebody says to me, you know what, that sermon really blessed me. You're not making a statement about me. 
As a matter of fact, you're not even making a statement about the sermon. You're saying when those words were spoken, there was a parting of the veil and something happened. There was a transaction that took place. Yeah, God used you and God used the sermon, but God can use anything. I was blessed. God poured a blessing for me in the words that were shared. When I get together with a friend and they leave feeling blessed, it's not because I work to try to orchestrate a blessing. Those, in fact, those that truly possess the ability to bless others and are aware of it are those that are most aware of the fact that on their own there can be no blessing. That it is truly something transcendent. That is something beyond us. And I think a lot of times we get so earthbound in our Christian walk, right? And God is so beyond us and transcendent. I think that's why a lot of us love watching The Chosen, right? We love watching The Chosen. Why? Because it takes this lofty, holy, untouchable God and brings him down to earth in Jesus in a way that we kind of get. And it kind of makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Why? Because this is where we are, and it's so plain, and it's so ordinary. What did Jesus come saying? The kingdom of God is at hand. The blessing of God is at hand. It's right here. Open your eyes and see it and live in it and enjoy it. The Christian life is nothing short of exhausting when you try to muster up blessings for others apart from a deep personal communion with the author of all blessings. It ends up being earthbound efforts to encourage or teach or preach or correct or convict. But that's not what God's after. God is in the business of blessing. The question is, what are we after? What are we after? See, it's easy to think that the progression goes like this. We pray for God to work or to move or to save, and God answers with abundant blessings. I think one of the best examples of this that that we can look at, just by way of illustration, is the example of Old Testament uh, Jacob, grandson of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, There were circumstances that he he was in at one time where Jacob prayed this prayer in Genesis 32, 11. He said, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid. I'm afraid he's going to come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. This is one of the patriarchs of the Bible, crying out to God, saying, God, I'm afraid. Save me. Great prayer. Great prayer. Then if you flip forward to the next chapter in the Bible, kind of jump to the end of the story, in chapter 33, Verse 4, we see, But Esau, the guy that he was afraid of, his brother, ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And we think, well, that's a beautiful story. There's the prayer, there's the answer. Here's the problem. Most of our lives is lived in this mushy middle. A lot of our lives is in that mushy middle. God, I've asked. I'm hoping for that answer. Where is it? Where are you? You say you never sleep or never slumber. Where are you? What's going on? So as with life, there's a period of trial between prayer and the answer. Jacob himself finds himself in a very lonely place. After he finished praying that prayer, Jacob was in a lonely place. No family, no friends, no servants, no possessions. He sent everything else on ahead. He said, I need some time just me. I need some quiet. I need some space. I need to think. I need to pray. Everything's gone, and it's just Jacob. His prayer has gone up, and that's all he can do. The circumstances, they don't look good. He's heard a story that the brother that he wronged so many times, so many years ago, has sent men charging in his direction because he's heard he's back in this territory once again after many, many years. That's all he heard. Esau's men are coming, and there's a lot of them. Circumstances don't look great. The relationship he prayed for was undone at his own hand. His brother would have every right to desire revenge. 
and in his aloneness, and in his poverty, and in his barren place, in all those question marks, God comes. Not to console, <laughs> not to pat him on the head, it'll be all right. Not to tell him the answer to his prayer even. And this to me is the interesting part. God actually comes to wrestle with him. What an interesting time for a wrestling match. Here he is all by himself. Oh, God, I've created this sacred space for you to pour out your abundant blessing on me. You want to what? How strange that God might come into this place where Jacob is with this answer. See, we often think of God's options as either save me or overlook me. Fix this or ignore this. Answer me or don't answer me. Remain silent. How strange that God comes in and says, not so fast. Let's wrestle. You told me how you want circumstances to work out, and I heard it. But I'd like to know what you really want in your heart of hearts. So there they are, wrestling away through the night, and Jacob gets the sense that this is, in fact, a divine encounter happening. You know what the objective of wrestling is? I've never been involved in wrestling, and I hope to never be. Uh, it's to pin your opponent down. That's when you win, when your opponent gets pinned. So all night long, in essence, Jacob is working to pin God down. I want to be unharmed by my brother. I want my possessions to be protected. I want my wives and my children to flourish. Who doesn't want those things? God, I'm trying to pin you down to get them. I'm sick of these question marks. He's using all his might to try to pin God down. And at the moment when he realizes he's utterly outmatched, then he really prays. Then he almost accidentally lets out a prayer that maybe he didn't even know he could formulate. And Jacob utters these words, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Boy, you ever think of that? What must that moment have been like? After wrestling all night, the cry of his heart wasn't, I'm afraid of my brother. The cry of his heart wasn't, what about who's going to take care of my family? The cry of his heart wasn't, what about all of my possessions and all of my servants? I've just spent 14 years. I've got these wives now. I don't know why you set me up for all of this just to be blown away by my brother. The cry of his heart was, I'm not letting go without your blessing. I want that veil parted and I want to touch you. I want to be in communion with you. I want to be in right relationship with you. And apparently, apparently that was all God was looking for. Because at that point, the match was over. Jacob lost. <laughs> Slight advantage God, right, in the God category. He touched his hip, it came undone. <laughs> Whoops, that's what happens when you wrestle with your maker. Jacob realizes just how outmatched he really was. That he could never force God to do his bidding because wrestling with God isn't about winning. It's about revealing the true desire of our heart. Are you living your life? Am I living my life in pursuit of God's blessing? Yes, that God would part the veil such that I desire nothing more than Him. That's part one of the blessing. But then part two, as God spoke to Abraham, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, so that you can go and now be a blessing. It's always in two parts with God. Isn't that frustrating? It's never just for me. It's never just mine. It's never just my little miracle. It's never my little experience with God. It's always God doing something in me so that he might show his glory and that I might be the vessel that displays that to bring glory and honor to him. The question is, what am I living? I'm going to close with this little illustration. Currently, 
in the state of Massachusetts, there's something called the unclaimed property division. Do you know about this? There is an unclaimed property division in the state of Massachusetts. And I looked on their website uh, this past week, and I found that uh, right now the piggy bank, they probably have something a little more sophisticated, in the state of Massachusetts for unclaimed property is three billion, with a B, dollars. Three billion dollars that belong to the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Think about it. There's people going to work every day, crunching the numbers every month, scrimping and saving, maybe clipping coupons. People still do that. And all the while, there's an account somewhere of refunds or forgotten stocks or unknown settlements for them in a pile of money that remains unclaimed. As I was thinking about that, I thought, I wonder if from God's perspective, we don't operate the same way when it comes to his blessing. Can you imagine just from his perspective, him going, I've got all of this. Literally everything is mine. And you pretend you need to get by with so little. So little of me, so little joy in your life, so little of, what if I give this much away? How will I get repaid? Keeping track and tallies of every little, every little scrap. God is a God of mission. And one of his missions is blessing. Yes, to speak words of blessing over you and me. To fill our lives with the blessing of his purpose to reorient our desires to be a blessing to others and to be honest enough before him that we might care enough to do the wrestling that we need to do so that nothing matters more to us than living under his blessing let's pray father we uh we want to conclude our time here with a time of reflection on the blessing that you have been uh, to each one of us. And so, Father, we, we ask that you would open our eyes and open our hearts to the reality that, God, we, we don't even pay attention so often to the myriad of blessings that have been poured out over us. We're so busy fretting and complaining and worrying about tomorrow and living in the what ifs. What if this and what if that? So busy trying to control our lives and the lives of those around us. God, what, is that? what does that look like from your perspective? Thank you for your patience with us we thank you for your blessing we thank you that over each one hearing this word you have spoken a blessing and you have said you are my beloved son you are my beloved daughter with you i'm well pleased i love you and i want to be in relationship with you god you have spoken these words over us you have said you don't call us servants you call us your friends you want us to be in relationship with you. Why? It's the mystery of the love of a father for his children. A perfect love. And as we're here tonight, we just celebrate that. We celebrate your perfect love for each one of us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. No beginning and no end, your mind.